Chapter 8, this is part 2. Part 1 is on another video. You can find the link in the description. Winston sat back against the window sill. It was no use going on. He was about to buy some more beer when the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the side of the room. The extra half liter was already working on him. Winston sat for a minute or two, gazing at his empty glass, and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out to the street again. Within 20 years at the most, he reflected, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now, since the few scattered survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. They remembered a million useless things, a quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long-dead sister's face, the swirls of dust on a windy morning 70 years ago, but all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which can see small objects but not large ones. And when memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life had got to be accepted, and because there did not because there did not exist and never again could exist any standard against which it could be tested. At this moment, his train of thought stopped abruptly. He halted and looked up. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops interspersed among the dwelling houses. Immediately above his head, there hung three discolored metal balls, which looked as if they had once been gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course, he was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought the diary. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet the instant he allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that although it was nearly 21 hours, the shop was still open. With the feeling he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say he was trying to buy new razor blades. The proprietor had just lighted a small a hanging oil lamp which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. He was a man of perhaps 60, frail and bowed, bowed with a long benevolent nose and mild eyes distorted by thick spectacles. His hair was almost white and his eyebrows were bushy and still black. His spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact that he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, as though faded, and his accent less debased than that of the majority of proles. I recognized you on the pavement, he said immediately. You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper that was. Cream laid, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, oh, I dare say, 50 years. He peered at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special I can do for you? Or did you want to look around? I was passing, said Winston vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. That's just as well, said the other, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. He made an apologetic gesture with his soft-palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer and no stock either. Furniture, china, glass, it's all been broken up by degrees. And of course, the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted because all around the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window, there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn out chisels, pen knives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered snuff boxes, agape brooches, and the like, which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered toward the table, his eye was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making about a, almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness, as of rainwater, in both the color and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange, pink, convoluted object that recalled a rose or a sea anemone. What is it? said Winston, fascinated. That's coral, that is, said the old man. It must have come from the Indian Ocean. They used to kind of embed it in the glass. That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago. More by the look of it. It's a beautiful thing, said Winston. It is a beautiful thing, said the other appreciatively. But there's not many that say so nowadays, he coughed. Now, if it so happened you wanted to buy it, that'd cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and eight pounds was, well, I can't work it out, but it was a lot of money. But who cares about genuine antiques nowadays, even the few that's left? Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. 
What appealed to him about it was it was not so much its beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. The soft, rain-watery glass was not like any glass that he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness, though he could guess that it w must once have been intended as a paperweight. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing, for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Winston realized that he would have accepted three, or even two. There's another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at, he said. There's not much in it, just a few pieces. We'll do it with a light if we're going upstairs. He lit another lamp and with a bowed back led the way slowly up the ste step, the steep and worn stairs, and along a tiny passage into a room which did not give on the street, but looked out on a cobbled yard in a forest of chimney pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room was meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep, slatternly armchair drawn up to the fire fireplace. An old-fashioned clock, glass clock with a 12-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window, and occupying nearly a quarter of the room, was an enormous bed with a mattress still on it. We lived here till my wife died, said the old man, half apologetically. I'm selling the furniture off by little by little. Now that's a beautiful mahogany bed, or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it, but I dare say you'd find it a little bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up so as to illuminate the whole room, and in the warm, dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it could probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion, to be abandoned as soon as thought of, but the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair beside an open fire with your feet in the fender and a kettle on the hob, utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, uh -huh, said the old man, I never had one of those things, too expensive, and I never seemed to feel the need of it somehow. Now, there's a nice gate leg table in the corner there, though of course you'd have to put new hinges on it if you wanted to use the flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner, and Winston had already gravitated toward it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the pearl quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceania a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man, still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame which hung on the other side of the fireplace, opposite the bed. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately. Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building with a rectangular window and a small tower in front. There was a railing running around the building, and at the rear end there was what appeared to be a statue. Winston gazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not remember the statue. The frame's fixed to the wall, said the old man, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, said Winston finally. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, outside the law courts. It was bombed in, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. St. Clement Danes, its name was. He smiled apologetically as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous. And added, orange and lemons say the bells of St. Clements. What's that, said Winston? Oh, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clements. That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. How it goes on, I don't remember, but I do know it ended up, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and when they came to, here comes a chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just the name of churches. All the London churches were in it, all the principal ones, that is. Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to term determine the age of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built since the Revolution, while anything that was obviously of earlier date was ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn, from history, learn history from architecture any more than one could learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets, anything that might throw light on the past had been systematically altered. I never knew it had been a church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man, though they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Ah, I've got it. Oranges, oranges and lemons, said the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, said the bells of St. Martin's. There now, that's as far as I can get. A farthing, that was a small copper coin. Looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's, asked Winston. 
St. Martin's? That's still standing. It's in Victory Square alongside the picture gallery, a building with a kind of triangular porch and pillars in front and a big flight of steps. Winston knew the place well. It was a museum used for propaganda displays of various kinds, scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses, waxwork tableau illustrating enemy atrocities and the like. St. Martin's in the Fields, it used to be called, supplemented the old man, though I don't recollect any fields anywhere in these parts. Winston did not buy the picture. It would have been an even more incongruous possession than the glass paperweight and impossible to carry home unless it were taken out of its frame. But he lingered for some minutes more, talking to the old man whose name he discovered was not Weeks, as one might have gathered from the inscription over the shop front, but Charrington. Mr. Charrington, it seemed, was a widower, aged 63, and had inhabited this shop for 30 years. Throughout that time, he had been intending to alter the name over the window, but had never quite got to the point of doing it. All the while that they were talking, the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings say the bells of St. Martin's. It was very curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells. The bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another, he seemed to hear them pealing forth. Yet so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone, so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitering the street before stepping out of the door. He had already made up his mind that after a suitable interval, a month, say, he would take the risk of visiting the shop again. It was perhaps not more dangerous than shirking an evening at the center. The serious piece of folly had been to come back here in the first place after buying the diary and without knowing whether the proprietor of the shop could be trusted. However, yes, he thought again, he would come back. He would buy further scraps of beautiful rubbish. He would buy the engraving of St. Clement Danes, take it out of its frame, and carry it home concealed in the, under the jacket of his overalls. He would drag the rest of that poem out of Mr. Charrington's memory. Even the lunatic project of renting the room upstairs flashed momentarily again through his mind. For perhaps five seconds, exultation made him careless, and he stepped out onto the pavement without so much a preliminary glance through the window. He had started humming an improvised tune. Orange and lemons say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me three farthings, sit. Suddenly his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement not ten meters away. It was the girl from the fiction department, the girl with dark hair. The light was failing, but there was no difficulty in recognizing her. She looked him straight in the face and then walked quickly on as though she had not seen him. For a few seconds, Winston was too paralyzed to move. Then he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment he was going in the wrong direction. At, one, at any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer the girl was spying on him. She must have followed him here because it was not credible that by pure chance she should have happened to be walking on the same evening up the same obscure back street, kilometers distant from any quarter where party members lived. It was too great a coincidence. Whether she was really an agent of the thought police or simply an amateur spy, Acute, accutated by officiousness, hardly mattered. It was, it was enough that she was watching him. Probably she had seen him go into the pub as well. It was an effort to walk. The lump of glass in his pocket banged against his thigh at every step, and he was half-minded to take it out and throw it away. The worst thing was the pain in his belly. For a couple of minutes, he had the feeling that he would die if he did not reach a lavatory soon. But there would be no public lavatories in a quarter like this. Then the spasm passed, leaving a dull ache behind. The street was a blind alley. Winston halted, stood for several seconds, wondering vaguely what to do, then turned round and began to retrace his steps. As he turned, it occurred to him that the girl had only passed him three minutes ago, and that by running, he could probably catch up with her. He could keep on her track till they were in some quiet place, then smash her skull with a cobblestone. The piece of glass in his pocket would be heavy enough for the job. But he abandoned the idea immediately, because even the thought of making any physical effort was unbearable. He could not run, he could not strike a blow, besides she was young and lusty and would defend herself. He thought also of hurrying to the community center and staying there till the place closed so as to establish a partial alibi for the evening, but that too was impossible. A deadly lassitude had taken hold of him. All he wanted was to get home quickly and then sit down and be quiet. It was after 22 hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off at the main at 23.30. He went into the kitchen, swallowed nearly a teacup full of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the alcove, sat down, and took the diary out of the drawer. But he did not open it all at once. For the, from the telescreen, a brassy female voice was squalling a patriotic song. He sat staring at the marble cover of his book, trying without success to shut the voice out of his consciousness. It was at night when they came for you. Always at night. The proper thing was to kill yourself before they got you. Undoubtedly, some people did so. Many of the disappearances were actually suicides. 
but it needed desperate courage to kill yourself in a world where firearms or any quick or certain poison was completely unprocurable. He thought with a kind of astonishment of the biological uselessness of pain and fear, the treachery of the human body which always freezes into inertia at exactly the moment when a special effort is needed. He might have silenced the dark-haired girl if he'd only acted quickly enough, but precisely because of the extremity of his danger, he lost the power to act. It struck him that in moments of crisis, one is never fighting against an external enemy, but always against one's own body. Even now, in spite of the gin, the dull ache in his belly made consecutive thought impossible. And it is the same, he perceived, in all seemingly heroic or tragic situations. On the battlefield, in the torture chamber, on a sinking ship, the issues that you are fighting for are always forgotten because the body swells up until it fills the universe. And even when you are not paralyzed by fright or screaming with pain, life is a moment-to-moment -moment struggle against hunger or cold or sleeplessness, against a sour stomach or an aching tooth. He opened the diary. It was important to write something down. The woman on the telescreen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick into his brain like jagged splinters of glass. He tried to think of O'Brien for whom or to whom the diary was written, but instead he began thinking of the things that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them. There was the routine of confession that had to be gone through, the groveling on the floor and screaming for mercy, the crack of broken bones, the smashed teeth and bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it since the end was always the same? Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped detection and nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had been succumbed to thought crime, it was certain that by a given date you would be dead. Why then did the horror, which altered nothing, have to lie embedded in future time? He tried with a little more success than before to summon up the image of O'Brien. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, O'Brien had said to him. He knew what it meant, or thought he knew. The place where there is no darkness was the imagined future, which one would never see, but which, by foreknowledge, one could mythic mystically share in. But with the voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue, a bitter dust which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam into his mind, displacing that of O'Brien. Just as he had done a few days earlier, he slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark mustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. All right, thanks for watching. Uh, there's a video description there's a chapter summary in the video description, and I will see you in the next chapter.